Oh, what's going on here? Oh, shit. All right, I'm good, right? Oh, boy. All right, I'm assuming I'm good. Hi, guys. Uh, I am not looking to get top. No, it's a joke. Anybody remember Hacks Hedrome? He was a guy. Hello. Hello, I am speaking as Hedrome. The man, the floating head. The floating head from your dreams. The floating head that has floated in every head. Matt Frewer, remember them? Matt Frewer, he was Max Hedrum. I was, was a big fan of Matt, Matt Frewer. I thought he was pretty good. Hello, everyone. What's going on with you folks? What's going on with the fine folks of the internated web? I don't know enough about Alfred McCoy to speak one way or the other about him. I'll admit that. Sorry. I talked about the left 16 pro the 1619 project, I think, a couple days ago. Uh... We've got a inebriated past coming out today about Upton Sinclair and the 1934 New York governor's race, which is genuinely an amazing uh, sort of pre-sequel to the har or a harbinger to the Sanders campaign in a lot of ways. Uh, and it should be fun to talk about. We'll see what you guys think. The left is a mess. It's a mess, folks. I oh, I can't believe it. It's such a mess. Bye-bye, honey. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know what? That's a good idea. So I'll t I'll, if people have questions about Sinclair and the campaign that they want to talk about after the episode comes out, that, yeah, by all means, bring them here. It'll be good. It'll be like a reading, a little reading series. Or a little, uh, like a study group or whatever you want to call it. To the degree you want to do that. I'm vibing with whatever you guys are putting down. Oh yeah, Kierkegaard. Yeah, he was a fellow traveler for sure. Yeah, now the leap of faith I now understand is literally like the engine of all thought. Yeah, no, I'm vibing hard on Mr. Kierkegaard. Well done, Soren. Somebody wants me to consider using a simple upvoting system to solicit questions. I don't know what that means. I don't know. I'm afraid. I'm scared. Is RBG dead or not? I mean, I probably, I think she's probably been dead for a while. I think that uh, the DNC budget that isn't sent, been sent towards killing people in the primary uh, has been spent keeping her alive in like an animatronic state. I think she might be a puppet. She might be an actual puppet. I feel like chicken tonight, like chicken tonight. Uh, oh no, don't tell me I'm breathing heavily again. Don't tell me I'm dying. I can't handle it. I start thinking I'm Gandolfini in a fucking hotel room in Rome and I'm going to pitch forward. I mean, I'd be okay with that, but I'd rather, I'd rather have a little bit more time. So please don't trigger me that way. If we run out of burgers, man, that's going to be the real, ooh, boy. I've been thinking about this. Like, 
the degree to which we have pulled back social tensions in this country by rapidly ratcheting down people's quality of life when that's the only thing we have to exchange for their rapidly alienated lives like we have spiritually and materially alienated everyone in this country to a monstrous degree and the only thing that is compensated for it is a regime of absolute perfectly imagined convenience it might not be real you might not always have perfect convenience but there is a dream of fully realized convenience and and then people get some percentage of that and it, and it makes them sort of okay with the system as it exists and there's a real chance that this flywheel might be broken and if that's the case there's not going to be anything holding back just the snapping of these fucking tensions one after the other and it's going to I predict, I predict bad news, just even if things stay stable in like a geopolitical sense and the economy technically still exists and you know, it's like, it's sort of like 2008 but worse, but otherwise things are basically stable. You're still going to see things start snapping at the social level because things are going to get coarser and coarser. And one of the things that's going to make that happen is we're probably going to be habituated to be okay with thousands of people dying of coronavirus and us not really caring about it because if we care about it then we can't participate in the economy and then we're back into a collapse which means we're all going to end up blaming ourselves to some degree for all this death which means we're going to have to start just to not to think about that we're going to dehumanize the dead which means we're going to dehumanize everyone around us and i think that those those social bonds are going to start snapping like fucking rigging in a in a sinking pirate ship and you're going to see some uh, uh, uptick in violence and stuff. It could be bad. But the thing that might stop that from happening is that the U.S. still is the consumer of last resort for the world economy. The U.S. The US economy is the only place where excess demand goes. If excess demand doesn't have somewhere to go, you have a buildup in the system. And at this point, it's a world economy and a buildup of demand that can't be expressed in the, in the economy or a buildup of supply, rather, a buildup of, of supply in the economy that cannot be uh, accommodated is genuinely catastrophic. You're talking about a world depression. So there's every interest in the world to see the U.S. bailed out of this in the short term. So they're going to bail money into us like crazy. But we're going to be pumping blood out of an aorta, and the question is, at some point, the body's going to, unless we patch up the wound, the body is going to start expiring. Uh, but if it doesn't, the good news is we have time, I think, because they're going to start pumping in a lot to try to stabilize this thing. And in that time, we can, like, organize as much as we can to resist it, to resist the new lines as they emerge. I don't want to get too doomer, because I honestly feel like at every level we have agency. We just have to be aware of where we are and what we can do. We just have to be conscious. We just have to be conscious, man. It's really true. If we're conscious of our moment, we can strike where we must. Olaf Palm assassination. Ooh, that's an interesting one. My gut is that it was boss. My gut it was the South African uh, apartheid era government, the ones that blew up Ruth first. Uh, they were known for espionage. They were known for extraterritorial assassinations, sort of the African version of the Condor. Uh, and Palm was considered a threat to a lot of interest there. But also in the Middle East, I know that he was... Uh, I know Israel... But the thing is, Israel and South Africa worked hand in glove in the 80s. So that could have easily been the pipeline. I don't know. It's a very interesting case. New, new inebriated passed today. Today it will be released. It's about Upton Sinclair's 1934 run for California governor. I think it's going to be a good one. Uh, it just dropped. Booyah. Brah. My single is dropping. Just dropped. Boom. Check out my my new my. I'm trying to ground things. Don't don't try to tell me to talk about Gnosticism because that's the kind of thing that'll get me off the beam. I'm trying to stay grounded, trying to ground everything in as close to a material observation as possible to stay 
connected. So this is all about translation. So yeah, let's ask things that are a little less uh, obscure than that, please. But I do love talking about Gnosticism. Oh no, don't fuck the beam. You must seek the beam. You must walk the beam. That is your goal in life. That if the, Whether you know it or not, the goal of your life is to walk on the beam. The beam is us, but we must be aware of it, yes. Oh yes, the Taipei Rebellion. The Taipei Rebellion really is really interesting. This is one of the biggest like modern wars in terms of casualties and number of people involved in it, 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 it since since the development of gunpowder in the West. It was a huge massive conflict. It was over 30 million people died, but it's almost never talked about outside of presumably China, but I don't know how they even contextualize it. Presumably it's some sort of like peasant precursor to the uh, Chinese Communist Revolution and therefore they're, they're, the good guys in their version are the Taiping and the bad guys are the, are the Empire uh, which I think is honestly kind of broadly true and I feel like it would have been better for China in the long run if the Taipei had won I feel like the, 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 uh, the king should have ended then or however the hell you say it uh, that was when they should have ended and honestly the reason they didn't end is because of western intervention because the Western powers, which at that moment were trying to carve up China and were in the process of fighting the Opium Wars to export uh, their, their, their surplus from their, from their trade in India uh, uh, to China. And the second Indian Opium War happened in the middle of the fucking rebellion. Um, but they eventually provided direct aid uh, to the, uh, the cause, and that helped sort of push them uh, into victory. And... Uh, I think I think that was a bungle from world historical perspective. Ching, the Ching. Yeah, no, they that that was their time. They had lost all legitimacy. But I really think that's another interesting thing about the... Uh, so it's this incredibly powerful and important event in world history. This hinge point, and you can kind of think of it as a thing that happened that didn't. Because you kind of think of everything as determined. But then you can stop back and like look at, well, what could realistically have happened here that didn't? And you're like, wow, there was a lot of, there was a lot of give in this. We could be much farther along in like progress as a civilization, but we could also be much worse case, much worse shape. You know, we don't know. Uh, but we can see how th how the contours of things shape up, and that is like one of those like you they almost knock the coke machine over, and then it knocked back on its heels. But then a couple more times and bang, it was over. Um, but the whole thing started basically because a guy failed his SATs. That is what caused the death of 30 million people in mid 19th century China. A dude flunked his finals. And I don't, I don't know. There's something very endearing about that, because uh, in in that in among the like the peasant class uh, in 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 Qing China, there was basically no social mobility outside the bureaucracy. If you were a member of the landless peasant class, especially the Hakka uh, migrants in the south who had migrated generations previously from northern climes and had never achieved any sort of uh, claim to land. The only way you're getting out of a pretty dreary peasant life is study for the damn imperial exams to become a bureaucrat, because they sure as shit needed a lot of those. And so these kids studied, and they studied, and they studied, and they studied, they crammed the hell out of it. And it was mostly rote re recitation of classic Confucian texts. It wasn't even like logic problems or anything. It was just cramming things directly into your face so that you could regurgitate them uh, in the testing area. 
And it was an incredibly, incredibly rigorous thing. It was like a 1% uh, pass rate. And you could retake it, but it cost money, and it took a long time between tries. And the dude who started the whole thing, he just lost, he, he failed too many times, and he fucking went, he, he went, he basically had a fever, he broke into a fever, he was in, in, uh, in a kind of a coma, coma state for a while, and when he came out, having read a bunch of Christian pamphlets that had been left in his village by uh, 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 Western missionaries, he decided that he had visited Jesus in heaven and discovered that he was his brother. And so he launched this peasant rebellion that spread through central China and eventually almost overtook the entire empire. It looked like it really honestly should have. Uh, and then they just kind of made some mistakes. They retrenched when they shouldn't have. They wait there, And then there was the divisive, decisive Western intervention. Um, but it's a very interesting story. And uh, it really does tell you, you know, you got to give kids a chance. They can't have to, they can't all have to be uh, that nerdy. You know, you got to let them skateboard sometimes. Relax. And it's interesting because you could kind of evaluate uh, the the process of the uh, of the Taipei Rebellion, and then map it. Then after the, the like you look at Taipei and then you look at what happened after it, culminating with the communist takeover. It's sort of like a a, a, a refracted version of itself sped up through by technology, because what you had uh, with the Taipei was a a, a stultified. Uh, a situation where you had like an excess of landless peasants, too many miles, not enough land, no efficient exchange, things were all built up, uh, there was no uh, legitimacy to the regime. The fact that it was a conqueror regime didn't help, certainly, that there wasn't Han Chinese who made it up. Uh, and this a figure comes out using a Western concept, this idea of like millennia Christianity, to like create a a a a, a uh, a state of urgency to create a people who demand change in the here and now because they're going to make something uh, spiritual, like out of matter, which they're getting directly from the West here in the form of imported Christianity, which then causes the whole thing to erupt and shatter. And then, like I said, forces probably would have eventually resolved with the the Taiping at least taking over a huge chunk of China. Instead, they were defeated with the help of the West. And then that rickety old empire, that Qing Empire, eventually knocked over by the Nationalist Rebellion with Sun Yat-sen, but then also, then basically breaking up into, an, uh, into anarchy because, you know, you can't just take over that height of power and expect to hold on to it when everything underneath it is destroyed. Uh, and then, if you think about it, the, the Chinese Communist re Rebellion is then a, a, a sped up a more successful technological replay of the Taiping where you have the same situation. You have mass numbers of peasants, well more than there are land, hugely exploited uh, rural peasantry, and then you have this uh, uh, Western idea of communism to rally them to, which then turns them into an organized and self-motivated unit to, dis to attack the rotten status quo, which they then defeat. Because it's not like Mao was the genius who thought, hey, let's get the peasantry involved. Mao was just enough of a person removed from dogma the dogmatism at the heart of like Soviet Marxism, which at that point was basically a religious dogma on par with like, you know, uh, uh, the Inquisition's Catholicism. Uh, he, was un he was uninvested enough in communism as a concept to think, well, to just recognize, well, we've just got our asses kicked in the cities. 
there is no more working class to organize. They just got massacred by the nationalists. There is this big chunk of landless peasants. So why don't we go to them? It was just recognizing the reality of where the social pressures were. And so then it's like it's Maoism, if in anything, is it's about adaptability. You know, because it was itself an adaption to the conditions on the ground using Marxism as like the basis. It was just a recognition of conditions. And that's all we should ever be seeking for is to recognize conditions through the lens of our ideology, but not determined entirely by our ideology. Hopefully by trying to honestly engage with the world around us in, in addition. Uh, somebody asked, why is there a tendency towards zealotry among uh, subaltern resistance groups? I honestly think what it is, is like you start involving yourself in a left-wing movement, in a, in, a, in, a, in a resistance movement, with the hope that you're going to immediately as possible overturn the conditions of your misery. Because that's what you want. You want this thing that sucks to stop. <clears throat> But the thing is, is that that fight takes time and it might take longer than realistically you could invest in believing things will change. And so that means that you either have to give up because you, you either give up because you know that it's not worth the, the additional pain of depriving yourself in, in the name of, you know, the re revolution. Um, or you get more benefit. You put all of your emotional investment in the cause uh, itself. And so... All of, your po all of your emotional energy goes into imagining the, po the, the, the party, the thing you're working towards, the thing you're working through as like the, the, the uh, repository of all of your emotional energy. And so that means that you get super, super strident on details of, uh, of uh, like ideology because it doesn't attach to the real world because the real world sucks. In the real world, you're doing nothing. You're in misery. You're eating soup. In a, in a safe house. In your head, though, you're fighting at the most deep levels of, like, uh, uh, historical minutia that have no connection to reality. But that's where all of your emotional energy is, because if it isn't there, it's here and now, and that sucks. I will definitely say that um, I, I have never, I'll admit that I never really vibed with David Lynch, but I should definitely give his films another look. Someone just said here that he is grill pill, and uh, even with my limited exposure to his work, he is 100% grill pill. He is clearly vibing at his own frequency, moving with as little friction through the world as possible, and I need to respect that by giving his uh, work more, more of a focus. Yeah, but who cares if he voted for Reagan? What difference does it make? Did he elect Ronald Reagan? Ronald Reagan won in two giant landslides. What did uh, David Lynch's two votes for Donald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, in two elections do to make anyone's life worse? How much did his films do to make people's lives better? Which one are you weighing more heavily? Where is your emotional energy? In the real world or in a fantasy realm where you're sorting people into good and bad and then having them fight each other like your your uh, your GI Joes, your childhood GI Joes. Your pokes, mon. Folks, we have a Cheeto in the White House. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but there is a goddamned. A cursed by God himself. Cursed to live in this world. A human mind embodied physically in the crumbling corn starch and corn syrup creation known as a Cheeto, a disgusting orange globule 
sitting in our White House and the people's house itself defiled by Cheeto dust. Cheeto dust, the, the dust mites the size of Frisbees. My God. We'll never get that color out. It'll never be the White House again. It will be the Orange House. It will always. The way that it's only the White House because they burned it down in the War of 1812 and we rebuilt it with white paint. It's now, the, it's now going to be the Orange House for all of history. Because the cursed Cheeto resides there. The cursed orange Cheeto. Ah, he defiles my mind. He's a damn Cheeto, folks, and I'm not a fan of him. Those are Doritos, by the way. You people are putting Doritos in the chat. He is not a Dorito. I think that uh, I think our Latino friends would say that's racist. It's going to be the Orange House. It's the Orange House, I'm telling you. Uh, do you think we need a Beppe Grille type? You know, that's what I've been thinking about. Is that the thing is, that's why I was thinking about Jesse Ventura. Because I honestly don't know how you can like break up the the kind of ossified ideas around the parties anymore. I feel like Democrats, Bernie needed to run as a Democrat because that's where like the, the eyeballs were. But like he needed enough people who just are never going to tune into a Democratic a race because they rightly perceive the Democrats as a scumbag party of capital, even if they don't think of it that way. So a third party with somebody who is largely known and charismatic and had the imperture of like the left, but also a pop culture buy-in to get past people's uh, dislike of politics, which is what Trump used, by the way. Because Trump, remember, ran as a celebrity. He didn't run as a rich guy. He didn't run as a Republican. He ran as a celebrity. And you, if you could take that energy, that spectacle energy, with and, and feed it into some goddamn like actual left in, uh, political infrastructure and some ideology to like buffer it up into a real boy it could be something damn it but i don't know if we have anybody like that like even jesse ventura honestly isn't like the perfect vehicle but he's better than a lot of the alternatives and now sadly it doesn't look like we're even going to get him so once again get your eye off of the ball of the presidential shit because at the end of the day there's nothing you can do at that level anymore it's going to be this disgusting nightmare display this these two zombies lashed to the mast of the sinking ship At this point, all I want is debates. Just give me debates, please. I want to watch the debates. I want to get blitzed out of my mind and watch the debates. That's all I want out of this world. Aliens can destroy the Earth the day after the debates. I don't care. Just let me see the dang de debates between these two senescent monsters. Sons debate, too. Please, for the love of God, give me a sons debate. That one seems like it might even happen because mm, the thing is, is that if uh, Hunter is in any way under the sway of the party, like if, if Tom Perez has like a body man on him who's keeping him narked up and doped and, you know, under surveillance and not in trouble, which I got to hope they're trying to do because they got to know he's a wild card. If he's under control, then he was, he's not going to honestly debate Don Jr. But if he gets wild, if he is like off the reservation and he just does a couple bumps or maybe smokes some crack and sees that, and he might just on impulse agree to do it. Like, let's do it tomorrow. And then knowing Don Jr., they're like, yes, do it on fucking Periscope or something or TikTok. Before the DNC even knows he's doing it. That's the only way it's going to happen. And it's a possibility. And boy, I don't know. I think I've been good enough lately that I want to get it. But also, if it doesn't happen, then it was not meant to be. But somewhere, just comfort yourself knowing that in some universe, the Suns debate does happen. And it's amazing. A K 
cursed Cheeto, gentlemen. Invading our own White House. The Oval Office. Orange. The Resolute Desk. Buried under a avalanche of orange dust. If people aren't going to be able to get meat, this shit's going to get violent. I think you, I mean, you know how meat fuel this country is. That death's got to go somewhere. You eat all that death, it's got to go somewhere. And if it's like built up and you can't keep murdering with your mouth, you're going to murder with something else. That energy's got to go. All that pent up murder, all that pent up aggression, all that pent up social anima, all that fucking orgone is going to have to go somewhere. And if we can't eat burgers and chicky chicky fillets and pork rib sliders, and oh boy, man, it is going to be a vast expression of uh, kinetic energy. There's going to be some kinetic scenarios. I don't know when and I don't know where, but in le if people don't get meat, there's going to be kinetic scenarios. I don't think it's going to get to that point. I think that the Chinese are going to help synthesize something that f brings flows in to maintain America as that needed still and a non-replaceable. Where else are you going to go? Where else are you going to go? You can't impoverish Europe enough uh, to fast enough to make them need all of the extra gigaws that we have to compensate for our alienated labor. And everywhere else, you don't have developed enough markets to absorb all of that. We're the only place. So they're going to try to save us. And that might move us along a little bit and, and stop us from having the worst possible outcome. It's all in our hands. That's why the grilling is for a reason. You're honing your katana, whatever it may be, to go forward into battle when battle is joined. And however that might and manifest itself. And the thing is, right now, we're in one of the most liquid moments in history that I can recall experiencing. I think it's got to be number one. And so we got to wait for points of friction to emerge, and I'm waiting with you guys. It's, it's an incredibly suspenseful moment. I feel, I feel like I'm just suspended. I feel like I'm in uh, that thing in the remake of Total Recall when they go through the center of the earth, and when you go around the middle, they all just whoop. They're floating. I feel like we're in there. We are grilling. We are grilling and chilling. We are chilling and grilling. Uh, compound in Montreal. I'm thinking about a compound one way or the other. I'll say that. I don't know if anybody knows any way to secure a perimeter and create some sort of self-sustaining mini ecology that can facilitate uh, some, like, you know, fractal level of a more ideal social coordination. Some sort of, uh, uh, some, some sort of, uh, Walden 3. That's what I'm thinking of. That's what I want to build. Walden 3. I'm kidding. No, I don't want to do that. I'm not a cult leader. Get out of there. Kanye is probably everyone's best bet. If you can't get in with Kanye or Jared Leto, I think you're in trouble. Uh, I think with Jared Leto, if you're a young woman uh, of a certain uh, size and shape, say, uh, I think you're probably going to get a better bet with Leto. Uh, I think Kanye might be open to bit more, a, a bigger variety of people. Uh, you're gonna be able. You're gonna have to vibe with him though. So uh, I hope you. I hope you really liked Jesus. I hope you're not just say to your friends that you like Jesus, because it's gonna be hard to get in if you don't really, really show him your enthusiasm for his work and how brilliant he is every moment.
Uh, Jared Leto's Wild Castle. That would be pretty cool. Things move so fast on this chat. It's difficult. Did somebody, what is this? Oh, would I be, would I be Jesse Ventura's VP? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? That would be the most fun thing to ever happen. How, how could I ever turn that down? I mean, that would be a ridiculous choice and it would never happen. But of course I would take that. That would be amazing. How would I even think twice about it? I could not think of a more perfect vision, a more perfect symmetry of, of like body and action and ability and enthusiasm. I would be embodied fully in that task. Yes, I will be Jesse Ventura's VP on the, on the green ticket. <laughs> but as I say, I don't think that would be a smart of my move on their part. But I would still say yes, because I'm sorry. It wouldn't really matter one way or the other. I might as well have some fun. How many thousands of pages is my manifesto going to be? I'm trying to keep it short. There, no, I'm not, there's will be no manifesto. I think I'm going to try to write stuff, though, just to refine ideas, like I know I've talked a lot about doing an episode about American Protestantism and sort of how it developed and, you know, its implications for America's political economy are. And I've realized that a good test case to sort of see where, I, at what level of abstraction I can kind of relate this stuff to, I'm going to try to write it out. I'm going to try to actually write it instead of doing it extemporaneously the way I've done all the other uh, inebriated pasts. This one I'm going to try to write out uh, like Mike Duncan or uh, Patrick Wyman style. And hopefully it's good and people find it compelling. And if so, I'll try. I'll probably be trying to write more, but I don't know yet what. Uh, do I think UBI is inevitable? Like I said, if they decide, if there is the will and ability to turn the spigot on. The only way that that works is if you see a huge, uh, huge Keynesian fill, uh, priming of the pump. Like there, and, and, it, and it can't be through public works and stuff like that because we wouldn't know where to put people because all of those arms are dead. All those networks have died, gone necrotic. So that means pure dump into the consumer economy uh, through, the, through the inflationary vehicle of uh, cash infusion uh, and the thing is is that we've been doing that and that's generally how we've been dealt that's how we bumped out slowly dumped out of the great recession was but it was all at the level of quantitative easing it was all at the level of direct cash into the marketplace at the highest level which of course then gets captured at every level so that by the time it gets to the consumer it's a drizzle. I mean, it is a trickle down, but it is a trickle. It is a little piss stream compared to how much money you're talking about, how much actual economic capacity you're representing in those transactions. So they could just dump a bunch of money into our economy and get us spending again. And that'll make, it'll still be tough, and it's still going to lead to a lot of fucking uh, unemployment, and it's going to lead to a lot of social discohesion. And like I said, I would expect now that violent crime might rise uh, in this context. Uh, it might be a lagging indicator, but I could see it, it kind of popping up through the social firmament. Uh, and obviously also all that fucking political, cultural tension that you see, that's only getting worse, for sure. Uh, but also there could be a big infusion of cash at the level like just bypassing the fucking bank level direct provision that could like stave off the worst for now and leave us in a situation where you know we're talking about uh we could look back on this in 10 years and be like that looked like a real that was a close one but we made it and then you know if we haven't really changed things we're actually gonna see the next big drop then but who's we can't know yet i don't know either it's a mystery. It is mystery. We are all still trapped in the in the wispy firmament of time and space in their eternal dance. Their eternal seductive 
uh, Caduceus-like dance of writhing snakes. You can learn if you if coding is something that makes sense to you. That would be a very useful skill to use that could like help you live in this world and make the world a better place. I mean, I mean, like I said, I think that we have the capacity with our understanding of computer science now to solve a lot of the computational problems that undergird uh, that challenge the 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 validity or the the uh, feasibility rather. Of, of socialist uh, central planning. I mean, trying to get past those uh, those signal uh, mistranslations in the economy, uh, that would obviate the need for the goddamn cash nexus in the first place. You could lobotomize the beast. But it all has to be through the correct application of computer uh, power and, and, uh, and sorting and all that stuff. Nothing I understand because I've always hated that end of the of the stick. I can't get those symbols. The symbols of numbers, the symbols representing the material world, I can't get it. I'm at a much higher level of abstraction. I always have been, baby. Just boop, boop, boop. I have one of the most unbalanced brains in human history. I'll actually tell you guys something. This is an open truth moment. This is no bullshit. I took the GRE. Uh, which, to, to get into graduate school. Uh, I was gonna be in. I was gonna do. I not with with nothing really else to do, nothing to know what to do. I decided that I would go to history. You know, that's a little lot of people in that in that questionable moment. You know, did is they're like, okay, we'll go to grad school. Uh, so I took the GRE, and that's it was divided into a math or and a uh, language section, right? And it's all percentiles of of the people who took it. So like if you get, so whatever percentile you get, that is the high, that is the percentage of people who you did better than who took the test. And I think I was something like 96 or 97 percentile for the verbal portion, which was good enough to get me into a middling uh, uh, graduate program. <laughs> but I swear to God, I was something under, I was like 10 percentile for math. It was like 10 or 12. I mean, I can't, I mean, I'm just saying this to say that I do not understand numbers. I do not understand numbers in any way. And so I don't understand how computers work, but it really does feel like we could figure out a lot of these computing problems. If people were, if more people were doing that than fucking building apps that helped enslave people to gig economy jobs and just uh, destroy existing uh, uh, job systems by... Uh, by disrupting local regulatory regimes, doing something that's actually socially productive. And the thing is, even if you have to work a real job, you can still work towards that goal. Just don't, uh, don't give up too soon. Don't give up the boat. Don't give up the ship. My brain is dumb. I have a bra I have a dumb brain. I know. I was. I'm just telling you guys. I'm telling you guys. I'm being honest and open, so people don't think I'm some sort of asshole. Because I. I just want to let you guys know that I'm being honest with all this stuff, and I, I'm coming from a position of good faith. And yes. I. My brain is bad. It's like a gummed up. Uh, it's like a gummed up uh, pasta strainer. That's my brain. Oh, Dr. John Brinkley. I referenced him today. Uh, Dr. John Brinkley is a fascinating American huckster. Uh, he was a guy who... <laughs> he really was like the Nick Riviera of the American West. He was a fraudulent doctor because back then it was uh, uh, accreditation for medical uh, uh, professional was so thin that you could basically write into a Cracker Jack box to get a thing that could get you paid to be a doctor somewhere. Uh, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, considering how tightly round in everything is now. Uh, but so this guy Brinkley with his Cracker Jack uh, diploma uh, 
creates a miracle cure for impotence, which involves the translation, the surgical implantation of goat testes into the male human gonadal sac. That's right. The gonadal sac. And that presumably this is what he would tell the hillbillies and plain folk who came to him. Yeah, you're gonna get the inf you're gonna get the animal power of that goat, and it's gonna get you up. Now, this probably had some sort of effect because obviously a lot of uh, erectile dysfunction is is psychosomatic. So I'm sure a number of people, even after after that healed up, they got hard, and they were like, "Damn, thank you, Doctor Brinkley." But for the most part, they would just get, you know, swollen balls uh, a lot of them died. But anyway, he became incredibly popular for this. People came all over the world. He had a, he had a, he had a place in, he had a place in Kansas. Hey, please. I'm sorry, sorry. He had a place in Kansas. And he, uh, and he, where he was, he would, what do you call it, uh, put the balls on, out of the people in Kansas. I got owned. I got out. Uh, he would take the balls and he would put them in the sacks of the people. And he became incredibly popular. Uh, and then eventually he got uh, stripped of his ability to do it because people kept dying and it was a wildly, uh, uh, you know, dangerous thing. And then he ran for governor of Kansas and came pretty close. He almost won. It was really like Mr. when Mr. Burns ran for governor, you know, because he wanted to stop having to pay taxes. Uh, it was sort of the same thing. He was going to become governor and then change the rules so that he could practice medicine in Kansas again. Uh, and he came pretty close, but he didn't win. And he ended up at a uh, he ended up having to go to ta uh, to um, northern Mexico because they wouldn't uh, allow him to operate in the United States. And he built a giant. Uh, array, a giant radio array that was so powerful uh, that it reached all the way across the continental United States and people as far away as like Oklahoma from the border could hear it in barbed wire and bed springs and shit. Like that's how powerful it was. And it, funnily enough, that radio station became the place where the vast, where most people in the country first heard country western music, which was like a regional phenomenon that uh, got national exposure for the first time through his radio station. Uh, yeah, so there you go, Dr. John Brinkley. He spread culture uh, and also horrible, horrible gonadal infections uh, by sowing goat testicles into human scrotums. I haven't had that many drinks, thank you. <laughs> what are we going to do with all these goat balls? Buddy, if I knew, I would tell you. I'm sure we would all tell each other because that's what the world economy's problem is going to be pretty soon with this huge drop in demand in America is they're going to have a bunch of orders for goat balls and nowhere to put them so that everyone's going to be wondering where to put the goat balls which is why I think we might get a short term UBI like a monthly check shit just so that we keep buying the goat balls uh, because I think there might just be enough slack left in the system at this point to stop like runaway collapse which I think I don't think anyone at the real top wants because you know I'm sure they'll be fine with living in their New Zealand bunkers but I think they would rather be able to go skiing in Stad and you know going to uh, uh, if they're pretentious enough going to you know the Lincoln Center and seeing uh, the the opera you know oh yes if you oh yes if you've been to Bangkok oh oh the Commodore's feast at uh, Lord Falcon's uh, palace is exquisite. They like that stuff, and they don't want it to go away. So, presumably that will prevent them from allowing just a free fall into oblivion. And the only real way they can do that without empowering workers too much, 
which they do not want at all, uh, is just dumping money into the system. So, yeah, I think we might be seeing a short-term UBI in the very near future. Sometimes you get too excited with the goat balls. Uh, Alfred Korzybski is a guy that my friend Rob was hipping me to today who I think I heard about. He's actually one of the f foundational minds behind neuro -lim linguistic programming. Uh, but a lot of his uh, the stuff that he talked about is uh, very similar to what I've been trying to explain. So I feel like he's a useful person. Like if somebody is, you know, at the right, uh, you know, confidence with material, if they're trying to figure out what I'm talking about, I think Korzybski gets a lot of it. Not all of it, but he gets a good chunk. And he should be, I think reading Korzybski and Marx, I think, are very useful. I think that reading Korzybski against Marx could be very useful uh, in making the person doing both understand both of them uh, better. So I would say uh, Korzybski is an interesting figure that I want to engage with more in the future. So shout out to good old Alfred Korzybski. Oh, is John Ditor the guy who claimed that he called, he was a time traveler? Is that the guy who said who who would write to a uh, to a forum and claim to be from the future and said that like the country was going to collapse? Wasn't that him? Yeah, that was funny. I never read enough of it, but uh, I respect anybody who would go that deeply into a character. That's a great bit. And you know what? At this point, uh, maybe he was real. Who knows? I'm pretty much open to everything. I'm kind of thinking time travel could happen. Just not the looper time travel or back to the future where like something happens to you in the future here and like your arm getting, no, fuck off. That doesn't happen. But you could have time travel. Sure, why not? As a treat. We could have a little time travel as a treat. Can we, can we, stop, it? Can we stop this argument? I, we just did laundry. I've got plenty of new, clean laundry. God, Jeff Gannon, that's a blast from the past. I guarantee you, what percent, all right, I'll just do a test. No guess, no bullshitting, just like I'm honestly asking you, don't look it up. Do you know who Jeff Gannon is? Do you, does that ring a bell? Because I gotta believe most of these kids listening to this or watching this who are, I gotta believe in their like 20s, have no idea who Jeff, I'm getting nothing, nothing. What kind of amazing mutant would be on here asking me about Jeff Gannon? How old are you, dude? Are, you can't be as old as me. That seems impossible, that there's anyone older than me on here. I feel like the oldest man in Twitch history. Oh, man. Jeff Gannon was a guy who was in the White House press corps during the Bush administration, W. And he would give these softball questions about how, like, uh, Mr. Rumsfeld, the tr America loves the troops more than ever. Uh, how can they help them express their love to the troops? That kind of thing, you know. Uh, Gall polls show that Amer uh, Bush is actually the smartest person to ever live. And how does he feel about being such a vision to everybody? And people eventually kind of said, "What is the deal?" And it turned out that he represented like a fake Mooney website, and that he also had a side hustle as a male prostitute. Uh, in D.C. specializing in, like, political figures. There are some people who think that he was actually Johnny Gosh, the uh, Franklin Credit Ring uh, abducted kid. I have no idea if that's true or not. It's a funny, it's certainly an amusing idea. But that's, God, that's such a blast from the past. Man. Just think, if you kids, think about all the stuff that's going to blow your mind when you imagine kid, kids aren't going to know anything about including, I mean, if we make it this far, Trump being president. Like, the, just the absurdity of that, they're going to have no actual memory of. How are you even going to communicate it? Unless we've so far transcended it by then, 
that it won't even be a meaningful thing. But if that's the case, I don't think we're going to be doing anything other than uh, Cormac mccarthy it, as they say. I'm glad somebody remembers Jeff Gannon. I believe his real name was Jeff Guckert or something. Real nice out tonight. It's excellent. Beautiful. Apparently it's going to be all stormy tomorrow. So I'll probably want to button up. But real nice today. I'm glad I got to be outside a little bit. Experience this backyard. Happy to have a little patch, even though it's basically just a little shack here. But, uh, yeah, it gives me a little bit of a, a little sun. Otherwise, I would probably be vitamin D deficient if I'm not already. I've had two doctors look at me with my shirt off and say, okay, I think you need to take vitamin D. Oh, yeah, the Gucker guy, the, the Jeff Gannon guy definitely was, like, an associate of Roger Stone, if you know what I mean. You know, people who associate with Roger Stone, like the people he would solicit in that uh, uh, personal ad, him and his wife looking for hung studs. But I love it, you know. He's better than uh, Manafort. Manafort was a monster. He was awful. He was evil Polly. It looked like Roger Stone was uh, ethical Polly. His wife seemed very much into it. But he seems like kind of a jerk in other areas. But I, think it's only the big that I would not be surprised if Roger Stone had goat testes. Ooh, the Black Eagle Trust. The Black Eagle Trust is a fun esoteric conspiracy theory uh, that says that after World War II, the U.S. Uh, took into its possession a massive amount of uh, gold from the uh, Japanese government or Japanese high officials or something, and that it was never declared... And it was used as like the basis, uh, as a fund for to fund basically every like evil CIA plot that has gone on since World War II. Uh, to me, it's like fun, but it also seems beside the point. Like they had plenty of ways to get money that didn't involve having to have Japanese gold. For one thing, there was the Nazi gold, <laughs> and the other thing is that there was the post-war drug trade, which they immediately got their beaks wet in. And also there's the black funds that are never accounted for. The trillions and trillions of dollars just in the Defense Department budget alone that are unreconciled and, and, and unreconcilable. It's just never going to be resolved. It's money that's in a quantum state forever. Which really does tell you that this idea that we could like run out of money is absurd. Like the money just went into, the, it went, it went into a black hole. It didn't even disappear. They can't even account for it. That's different. It's like a... It's like a, it's like a uh, it's floating in space. It's it's like it's like a giant. Uh, the the Pentagon is like a giant Schrodinger a box, filled with like twenty trillion uh, Schrodinger bucks that both exist and don't exist at the same time. A little bit of clapping. I'm not looking at the flyover. No, thank you. I don't even know where it would be. I'm not near where the thing is flying. I'm way up in the, I'm in the middle of Brooklyn, so I don't think I would even see it. So yeah, there's plenty of money for them to go around. They don't need China, they don't need Japanese gold. You know, it's like, who, so, how does that determine the outcome of events is what I don't understand. So, but it's fun. They're all fun. The gemstone files. If anyone knows the gemstone files, those are hilarious. I got, I, I got into that shit in high school. Uh, I got a, like a print off on a dot matrix printer of the skeleton key to the gemstone files. And I read that shit about how Aristotle Onassis was like the global got crime kingpin who assassinated everybody and him and Howard Hughes basically ruled the entirety of the post-war uh, uh, Western economy and pulled the strings of everything using heart attack potions and shit. Excellent stuff. Very fun. Hearing that people like applauding, it's like, 
as long as people know that it's not enough, you know, as long as people use this moment to remember what their duties are to each other, I think it's good. You know, and it's like, it could be either for everyone. And I think people end up fighting because they assume they can only be way, one way, but it's, you know, it's, it's always a degree of both. So it's worth tending to the good part rather than yelling at the bad part. Maybe, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Righteous gemstone files, nice. Virgil's doing okay. I talked to him on, about Rick and Morty. Uh, I, I tweeted, I, I texted to him. He gave me, he's, he's apparently a big fan of the new episode, so he's doing all right. He can still appreciate good comedy. He still has the requisite IQ to appreciate Rick and Morty and all of its intricacies. All right, guys, it's been an hour. Uh good to talk to you. I'll see you guys tomorrow. We'll delve into some more stuff. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll have a few uh, for stuff prepared too. We'll do a little uh, less freeform maybe. I don't know. We'll talk. See you guys. Bye-bye.